The way in which one decides to address the question of what it is a woman has also implications for what one can say about the issue of transsexual and transgender identities and the situation of trans women in particular. Tracing the fraught relationship between trans activism and feminism to its most contemporary manifestations would take us through a complicated labyrinth that is best explored through a paced and careful examination of the different historical stages which shaped, for better or worse, the current positions. A good guide to start is the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on feminist perspective on trans issues. Rather, in this short lecture, I aim to link the previous arguments in discussion about sex-gender distinction to the question, or one might say to the challenge, of a trans-inclusionary feminism. According to the positional account which emerges in the aftermath of the criticism of the sex-gender distinction, the category of women is a kind of a class or caste term. And this might sound intrinsically exclusionary. For instance, it is true that some feminists have used such a view to support the strong position that a person born male cannot become a woman. For instance, they have argued that trans women enjoy male privilege due to having lived as men before living as women, a privileged history which cannot be shed or shared. However, a positional account can be understood also as rejecting only the idea that being a woman is nothing more than a state of mind, a way that we feel inside. Instead, the account insists that there is much more to it than that. Women are those who occupy a particular position in society relative to men, regardless of how anyone feels about it, and who face particular kinds of discrimination and oppression. Another pitfall that the account of the category of women must avoid is that of denying the significance of differences among the oppressed class that we associate with the term women. Just as a woman is oppressed in a different way depending on whether she is white or black or brown, middle, upper or working class, it is also true that she is oppressed in a different way depending on whether she is cisgender or whether she was originally categorized by society as male. Each of these identities might carry with it certain kinds of privilege. In the case of white and upper or middle class women, this is obvious enough. But it may also be true that black and working class women are exempt from certain forms of oppression which apply in particular or predominantly to more privileged women. For instance, affluent white women have historically been more likely to be confined to the home, while black and working class women have been not only allowed but compelled to work. And this kind of exemption might itself be described in a very thin sense as a form of privilege. Even at a stretch, male privilege, in the sense of being a treatment that is disproportionately applied to men rather than women. Clearly, none of this means that, for instance, black and working class women are not women. By the same logic, we can allow that the situation of trans women is not equivalent to that of cis women, and even that the situation sometimes carries an exemption from certain aspects of oppression which apply to cis women, without concluding that they must therefore be denied their identity as women. Trans women are oppressed in many of the same ways that cis women are. This is insofar as society treats them as women. To the extent that this treatment stops um, short of a full recognition and acceptance of their gender identities, trans people of whatever gender might be oppressed as trans. Moreover, the situation of trans women is not then similar to that of privileged subsets within the class of women, for instance of white women, where the privilege attached to membership of those subsets far outweighs any disadvantages. On the contrary, trans women suffer other types of formal and informal discrimination and violence. With respect to this issue, the question of whether and when to call someone a woman is not a metaphysical or conceptual question, a question about what that person really is but a practical, political and ethical question. It is a question about the sorts of social practices which are inflicted on them and which shape their experiences, 
and it is also a practical question in the sense of being answerable to the feminist goal of bringing the oppression that centers around the categories of sex and gender to an end. So, it can be argued that there is room for feminism for women who have lived as men or boys. Moreover, feminism as a movement stands to benefit from trans insights into the system of patriarchy. If the epistemic vantage point of trans women is discussed, it is often to make the argument that the latter can never really know what it is like to have been born female and to have been socialized from your earliest moments in line with what is expected of a woman or girl. What is less often acknowledged is that the situation of a trans woman or a person transitioning to womanhood can also carry epistemic advantages which are not available to cis women. What to women who have always been treated women or girls may sound normal as to be invisible can for someone entering the social identity of womanhood as a conscious adult be completely vivid. Very generally speaking, a trans feminist stance will take the oppression of trans women as its starting point. However, this general commitment has been unpacked in various ways by different philosophers and trans activists. I want to run briefly through two examples. The first one is the Trans Feminist Manifesto articulated by Yemi Koyama. Koyama defines trans feminism as primarily a movement by and for trans women who view their liberation to be intrinsically linked to the liberation of all women and beyond. So for Koyama, trans feminism stands up for trans and non-trans women and asks non-trans women to stand up for trans women in return, thereby embracing feminist coalition politics. So the issues that are on the trans feminist political agenda include things about body image, violence against women, and health and reproductive choices. While Koyama calls trans women to avoid the uptake of sexist forms of gender, as well as refusing any traditional appeal to um, essentializing a gender identity, she also recognizes that trans women can find themselves in situations in which uptake of traditional forms of gender are necessary to secure access to medical technologies, also to secure legitimation as real women, and avoidance of transphobic violence through passing as non-trans. She does raise worries about the purest demand that a trans woman eradicate all gender stereotypes in a society in which such stereotypes pervade. Koyama also insists on the priority of larger scale coalition politics, leaving individual women to make their own personal decisions about how to negotiate gender, free of judgments about who does and does not count as a feminist. In a related vein, she also points out that feminist solidarity does not presuppose some monolithically shared experience, either within the class of cis women or between the class of cis women and trans women. Another movement towards um, trans feminism is articulated by Talia Betia, uh, who is developing an account of trans feminism based um, on a conception of trans oppression. She starts by arguing against two widespread accounts of transsexuality. One, the wrong body account of transsexuality, according to which gender identity is innate, allegedly determining one's real sex. And against the beyond the binary vision. She points out that both types of accounts invalidate trans identities. The wrong body account it does so by invalidating the self-identities of trans people who do not regard their genitals as wrong, and the second by representing all trans people as problematically positioned with regards to the binary.
Moreover, she points out that both accounts seem to fail on their own terms. While beyond the binary politics tends to marginalize trans people who position themselves within the binary, and therefore falls, fails as a complete account of trans oppression and resistance, the wrong body account fails to secure trans identity claims to belong to their preferred gender categories. Betcher's aim is to provide an account of trans politics that does not marginalize trans people who situate themselves within the binary and that successfully grounds their self-identity claims. So instead of attempting to justify trans self-identity claims, Betcher argues that such claims ought to be accepted as presumptively valid as a starting point of trans theory and trans politics. In line with this, she endorses the general view that many trans people tend to oppose the meaning of mainstream gender terms and practices. She points out that in many trans subcultures, the meaning of terms such as woman and man are altered so that both trans men and trans women turn out paradigm instances of men and women respectively. Betcher characterizes the nature of trans oppression largely in terms of a form of transphobia that she calls real reality enforcement. So she says that the identity invalidation of trans men and trans women occurs in discourses about appearance, reality, exposure, discovery, and deception. Reality enforcement takes two forms given by the possibility of a trans person being visibly trans or passing as non-trans. So, trans individuals may be viewed as playing at harmless make-believe, or in the second case, they may be viewed as deceptive when exposed. Either way, according to Betcher, trans self-identities are invalidated. Betcher's analysis points to ways in which reality enforcement, sexist and racist forms of oppression, interact. She argues that since reality enforcement is involved in broader relations of sexual violence, and since such violence has been interwoven with ra racial injustice, reality enforcement is likewise grounded in racial oppression. Along these lines, she diagnoses that transphobic feminist representation of trans women as deceivers and rapists are fundamentally drawing on a heterosexist, sexually abusive and rape facilitating system in which gender presentation communicates genital status. Now, both Koyama and Betcher's accounts emphasize the possibility of productive interplay between feminist and trans theory and politics, as well as solidarity between trans and non-trans feminists. Some of the main topics which are currently up for trans-feminist philosophical investigation remain those concerning conceptions of the self and its relation to the categories of oppression and resistance. <laughs>